I, I'm sorry. Um, I'd recommend that you take a minute to go through the audio setup wizard under the tools menu found at the top left of the screen. It will improve your audio quality and give you the best experience. Um, if you might be interested in receiving follow-up information from us, I request that you please enter your email into the your email address into the chat box. We'll be sending information out to everyone after the webinar, and it will probably be the easiest way for you to get links to some of the resources that our presenters will be mentioning today. Um, I've turned off everybody's microphone, so our primary way of communicating and asking questions is going to be through the chat box. If we leave everyone's microphones on, we end up with too much feedback and poor audio quality. So that's why we're doing it that way. Um, I'm going to be monitoring what's going on in the chat box during the webinar. And so if you have any questions or comments, please type them in. Um, and we will be uh, making sure we get to everyone's questions. Um, and so once again, our webinar tonight is Land Access for Beginning Farmers. It's the first session of a two-part series. The second session will be on March 23rd at 7 p.m. Tonight's session will focus on the basic concepts about holding farmland. We'll be looking at vari various options, including owning and leasing, kinds of leases, affordability, and searching for farmland. We have two wonderful presenters with us tonight. They are Ben Waterman, who's coordinator of the Land Access Program at the University of Vermont Center for Sustainable Agriculture, and Kathy Roof, who is co-director of Land for Good, which is a New England nonprofit organization that specializes in working land access and farm succession. Um, a little bit about Ben, he coordinates the Land Access Program, and he provides consulting services to landowners and farmers on natural resource management, farm enterprise startup, farmland conservation, land use regulation, and farmland tenure. And Ben is also a beginning farmer himself. Kathy, who lives in Western Massachusetts, has worked for over two decades on beginning farmer and land tenure issues. And she also coordinates the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thanks, Beth. I'm going to trust that everybody can hear me. Um, Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this webinar. As Beth mentioned, uh, Ben and I will be presenting uh, this two-part series. Uh, I'll be doing uh, most of the guiding through the PowerPoint for this evening, and Ben will take the lead next time. Uh, as Beth mentioned, as you have questions, please type them into the chat box. And Beth, as I understand it, you'll be reading through those, and uh, we'll break from time to time to answer questions and also to give Ben a chance to turn on his mic and participate. <coughs> so <coughs> with that, I believe I will be able to move our slides forward. No. Yes, I'm clicking the forward. There we go. Um, all right. Seems to be working. <coughs> so in this webinar this evening. We're going to focus on some of the basic concepts of land access. We're going to talk about tenure, what it means, and what some of the options are, and focus uh, a little bit on some of the new thinking about uh, getting onto land. Uh, appears to take a while for this. Kathy, I think I need to do it for you. So just say. Oh, just say right? next slide and I'll say, and I'll move it for you. Just say next slide and I'll. Okay, Next slide. So I'll just put my mouse aside. All right. So uh, as all of you know, otherwise you probably wouldn't be on this webinar. Uh, access to land and acquiring land um, one of the biggest challenges facing beginning farmers in particular. <coughs> and so in our experience. What we really stress in terms of getting onto land and finding land and making decisions about land are two elements. One is very clearly understanding and learning about all of your options, which is a focus of this webinar. And then being really ready to acquire land in the strategy uh, that makes the most sense for you. So learning your options and being 
adequately prepared to acquire land are two of the biggest things that you can do to make smart decisions about getting onto land. Next slide. So if you've been searching for land or thinking about how to make a decision about land, you probably know some of these challenges. Certainly for many of us in New England, the uh, cost of land uh, is a formidable barrier, especially if you're thinking about purchasing it. Not only that, but competition for land, for development and other non-farming uses, as well as from uh, well-established farmers in terms of renting land and um, driving up the price both for rent and for purchasing land. <coughs> More and more farmers, perhaps many of you, come from non-farming backgrounds, so it's not like it was several generations ago where the typically the firstborn son, but some, uh, in general, a, a next generation person from in the family would acquire the farm. And many new farmers don't have farms to go back to or to just that easily take over. We know that the farm population is aging, and there are several studies that show that very few exiting farmers have adequately prepared for succession. In one study in Iowa, it showed that only one-third of farmers who were preparing to exit farming had identified successors. So the fact that farmers are staying much longer onto the farm, that fewer next generation people from within the family are taking on the farm operation and that it's increasingly difficult to locate successors means that there's a lot of farms out there that don't have adequate plans for them to be passed on. Uh, another challenge is that there's sort of a culture and some myths around farm ownership even within the farming community that says that you're not a real farmer unless you own your farm. In fact, nearly half of farmers in the U.S. rent some or all of the land that they farm. So this notion of, you know, that owning land is really the ultimate goal or the only bona fide way to be a farmer is really dispelled by fact and also by necessity. Next slide. More challenges. Oftentimes we talk about access to land and land affordability without addressing at the at least equal challenge about um, acquiring affordable housing on or near enough the farm to make it a viable uh, living situation and operation because the cost of housing in most areas of New England, you know, is, is out of reach even if you were to be able to score some affordable farmland. A couple of you early on while we were waiting for the webinar to begin talked about how to find land and these days our depleted support infrastructure in terms of um, everything from extension educators to uh, agricultural lenders to veterinarians to input suppliers. All of that has really um, is only a pittance of what it was a decade or two ago, and that's the kind of network, both formal and informal, that people relied on largely to find farms. So that's also another challenge. We've also found that most business planning courses don't adequately address land acquisition. That we feel that um, that business planning for the operation is critical. Personal business planning is critical, and the third leg on that stool is land acquisition planning from a financial point of view. So oftentimes that's not adequately built in. There's an assumption that you sort of have the land and now you can start the business. Next slide. So what do we mean by tenure and why is it important to think about it? Oops, could you go back please? Thank you. Tenure is Latin, it means to hold, and what we're going to talk about this evening are that there are various ways to hold land, and the decisions that you make have as much to do about your personal and family goals as it is a de business decision uh, about the placement of equity, among other things, but also your personal values about the nature of property, about ownership, about legacy. We've talked with many farmers, and you may know some yourself, for whom uh, owning property immediately or, in fact, ever is not a high value. And there are groups and organizations that are, you know, really advocate for some very 
alternative ways of thinking about property ownership, particularly on this day and age when we, you know, really have some core questions about the nature of um, that kind of relationship to property. Next slide, please. So what are the basics when we talk about holding land, uh, when we talk about tenure? There's essentially four elements on this slide. The first one being access. It seems pretty obvious, but you, in order to make a successful farm operation, you need to be able to not only get on that land, but use it in the way that you need to be able to use it. That may be only land. That may be buildings. You need to be able to um, to have the responsibility and authority to manage that property and to use it in the way that you're going to build your business. That also means sufficient flexibility to change uses and to change the nature of the access that you have. Security is something that people talk a lot about, especially if you don't aren't able to own land or don't anticipate owning land. And security needs to be sufficient and appropriate to your business and to where you are in your career path. And a lot of times people say, well, a one-year lease or a three-year lease, you know, isn't adequate security. Often that's true, but if you're just starting out or you're not sure that you want to be doing the kind of operation that you are exploring or you're not sure that that's where you want to live or your fiancé might get a job somewhere else, you may find that a three-year lease or even an annual agreement in that early stage of your career uh, is sufficient and appropriate. So security needs to reflect what is best for you and your current situation. An equitable and clear division of rights and responsibilities is really critical. In fact, it's more critical than who actually holds title to the land. And we'll talk more about that in, uh, when we talk about um, leases and such. The, uh, the final element of what you really need at the core are ways to address the issue of equity. And it doesn't necessarily mean that unless you're able to build equity, it's a lousy situation. You might find that uh, a uh, flexible opportunity on land where you're not able to um, build equity at the moment, but you uh, place your, uh, your earnings in another um, type of equity rather than in the land makes a, a perfectly appropriate sense. So again, flexibility, but thinking about equity, division of rights and responsibilities, adequate security, and flexible and appropriate access to use the property as you need to. Next slide, please. So when we talk about tenure options and variety of tenure situations, uh, there really is a two-pronged fork in the road. And it's either to own the land or not own the land. So unpacking each of those means really under what terms and conditions might you own or purchase to own land, and under what terms and conditions might you rent land in a situation that's best for you. What's really important in thinking about this in terms of tenure for yourself is that, as I mentioned before, you can own some land and rent some land. <coughs> you might rent land now and begin to acquire land through a purchase over time. So what your tenure situation is is going to depend very personally on what your um, family and business requirements are. They may change over time, and that's perfectly uh, expected. Next slide. Uh, we'll go through this slide and then we'll break to see, Ben, if you have anything else that you would like to add or if there are any pressing questions because I'm not able to look at the chat box and <clears throat> at the same time. So Ben is going to talk a little bit more about this in the next session in a couple of weeks. Uh, it, we, uh, in the past, I used to get calls from people who said plaintively, well, I just bought a farm. Now I don't know what I can farm on it. Um, it may make sense if you hear that to say, well, you really ought to know what you want to do first and then find the land to fit the enterprise. 
doesn't always work that way. You might find land and then it fits a lot of your other needs. And if you're deciding about whether you want an animal agriculture component, um, the land might speak to you in a certain way, or it might really be suitable for orchard where you hadn't thought about that before. So it is a little bit of a back and forth. In any event, you need to build in adequate flexibility in your business plan to uh, respond to land acquisition situations in terms of uh, including things that may not work out so well so that you are not uh, painting yourself into a corner. And that means making room for revisions in your business plan as well. <clears throat> OK, I'm going to turn my mic off and yeah, hand thanks, it over Kathy. to you, Ben. Uh, first, I just wanted to cite an example of what you talked about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, before I, I go on, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Can you do the smiley face thing if, if everyone can hear me OK? Uh, click on the smiley face icon right beneath all the names up there. Wonderful. Yeah, so, so Kathy was talking a, a couple of minutes ago about how some farmers, well, over half farmers in the United States uh, rent some or all of their land. I just wanted to cite a, a particular example in Vermont. Um, if you go to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project website, uh, we did an interview and, and a profile on Lila Bennett and David Robb of Tangletown Farm. Uh, they're right outside of Montpelier. And they're a great example of farmers that are just starting up. They're, they're very successful in their early stages. Um, and, and their business really revolves around owning just a tiny portion of land and leasing, um, leasing the rest. I think they own about two acres where their house is situated. And they own 100 acres a couple miles away from their house where they, where they graze their animals. And then they own an additional 30 acres in another spot just a couple miles further. Um, so if you're interested in reading a little bit more about them, again, their profile is on the UVM Extension New Farmer Project website. And there are lots of examples um, of these farmers all over the place. Um, you know, it makes business sense, of course, because um, the, the, the ownership costs can be plowed, you know, that the farmer is not paying while they're leasing can be plowed back into the business. That's, that's just one advantage. Um, while I have the floor here, Kathy, I just wanted to go back to your earlier, I think one of your earliest slides uh, when you were discussing the challenges uh, that beginning farmers face in finding land. Um, we talked about how support structure has been depleted. There, there are not many organizations out there that are assisting farmers to find land. Um, and I just want to make the point that that is definitely true. Uh, we are limited in our, in our capacity to actively seek out properties and connect farmers with opportunities. But, um, but we are currently scaling up our services, and we are constantly on the lookout for new opportunities. Uh, we can't really be active matchmakers, but we are constantly looking for, for new and viable opportunities for beginning farmers. Um, and you know, we're happy to talk with anyone about what kind of opportunities are out there right now. Um, you know, for example, we work a lot with landowners to develop alternative tenure situations. You know, we might not be combing the real estate listings for, for properties that are being sold at a bargain price, but um, we are working closely with landowners who are, are exploring ways to partner with farmers to develop operations um, that, would, um, that might involve a lease to own situation or um, maybe a, a, a lease term that's longer than, than three years. So do check back with us from time to time. I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Kathy. OK, I believe I'm on again. Um, thanks, Ben. And certainly a, a common question comes up about how to find land. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, to me, I like to make clear that finding the property and evaluating a particular property for its suitability are only two of several steps in the land acquisition process. So acquiring land and finding land or looking for land are not the same thing. Can you forward the slide, please, Beth? OK. So now we're going to get a little bit into um, what Ben just started to touch on. The, two, the fork in the road we mentioned before is either you own or you don't own. So leasing and renting are essentially synonymous versus owning your own land. The advantages of ownership 
uh, you could probably all cite yourselves, uh, maximum security. Ownership is the uh, uh, ultimate in security, although everybody points out that even owning land, you don't own all of the rights to ownership. You know, the town zoning still has authority over what you can and can't do. There's eminent domain and so on. But by and large, you know, it gives you maximum security. You do build equity in the real estate. You're able to use it as collateral. It does give a meaningful legacy, and oftentimes there are people who feel, you know, that's a deep connection and uh, brings up strong emotional ties when you do own the land and you make investment in the land, and it's something that you can pass on. Uh, those are those are not feelings to be easily dismissed. So that's um, that's an important element. Next slide, please. Disadvantages of ownership, again, Ben touched on those briefly, um, starting out with the, the debt that's required to carry real estate, especially if it includes a, a home and substantial land and buildings, uh, can really hamstring an operation and often leads to failure. Ties up the capital that you might use for operating or purchase of equipment or livestock or so on. Sometimes ownership is what we might think of as too permanent. It's much more difficult to get out of a farming uh, situation if you have purchased it. Let's say that you wind up needing to be in another location, or your farm fails, or you become disabled, or you decide you don't like farming anymore. Um, you know, when you're in the early stages of your <coughs> of your career as well. And then, of course, uh, ownership of land and infrastructure is a considerable responsibility, not to be taken lightly when you're also trying to be responsible for starting up a business. You might be starting up a family or a relationship. So uh, you know that is something to think about as well. Next slide, Beth, please. Leasing. Now, there are advantages to leasing. Touched on these already. Flexibility. You can test. You can test your enterprise. You can test your production methods. You can test your market. I've heard of people say, well, we bought this piece of property next to the road because we thought we'd want to do a farm stand. Now come to find out we can't stand the traffic and we really don't like dealing with the public and we really wish we hadn't made this decision. So an advantage of leasing, of course, is that you can always leave that property with much less uh, difficulty than if you owned it. You can apply your capital to other uses, uh, in, including uh, operating expenses, purchase of other um, capital needs, and uh, in investing in other ways, including your own retirement. You're carrying less debt. And that results in a greater financial return to family living. Uh, if you cost out, we have a spreadsheet that shows um, the net return to family living uh, in a rental versus an ownership situation, and even on paying for land that has an easement, which makes the ownership more affordable, you still have a greater return through a rental agreement. And finally, an advantage of leasing might be that clearly, for many beginning farmers, it's your only option. Next slide, please. And of course, there are disadvantages to leasing. As we talked about before, um, there is less security. And some leasing situations are less secure than others. And we're going to talk about that shortly. It's more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult to build equity um, in a situation where you don't own the real estate. You obviously don't benefit from the appreciation in, in land. And you can lose investments in improvements, and whether that's if you build something or you've um, put your heart and soul into building the soil, only to find that you're not able to stay there. So those are uh, considerable disadvantages. Additionally, you might not be able to borrow. Some lenders don't look favorably on leases, especially if they're short term. And there are some USDA programs where you need a lease of at least a certain length to participate in some of the cost share and conservation programs. Finally, um, when you own your own land, you don't have to deal with a landlord. If you're renting land, you have a, a landlord, and you may have more than one landlord. In fact, there are people 
that I know that have, you know, half a dozen or even a dozen landlords spread out. So there, there, um, there are relationship issues and communication issues and paperwork issues and so on. So that's something that you need to be uh, enter into a leasing situation with your eyes open. Uh, ben is pointing out that there's also, yeah, I wasn't going to get into the weeds, but there is, it is true, there's a tax deduction for a, for a rental, and that's limited to if you can demonstrate that you've actually paid cash. Thanks, Ben. Next slide. So before we get to ownership, are there any particular questions that people want to bring up? Or Ben, uh, if you have anything you want to add, in which case send me a message and I'll turn my mic off. Kathy, do you want to, this is Beth, Kathy, do you want to address the question of building equity while you're renting now or that will come later? While you're renting now or that will come later? Okay. Uh, that's going to come later. Okay. So if people can be um, patient with that. We can that. be patient. Ben could be, be patient. Be a preview to the next webinar. All right, I guess I need to turn off my mic for that. Yeah, I just thought this might be a good time to break for a minute, Kathy. Um, while you're m mentioning financial readiness, I could just give a short preview to what's coming up in the, in the next webinar in two weeks. Uh, so part two of this land access series will be on March 23rd at 7 p.m. And we'll really be diving into the topic of financial readiness. What are the considerations that go into business planning for for in preparation for land tenure, um, and what are the other considerations uh, that you should be prepared to to factor in to your decision making when it comes to owning land versus leasing? Um, so we'll go over, over other topics that are not covered in tonight's webinar, such as all of the particular costs in associated with owning land and the costs associated with, with leasing land, such as you, know, you need to budget money for repairs and, and maintenance. Um, that would be your responsibility as a tenant still. Uh, we'll go through eligib eligibility requirements of certain tax benefit programs, uh, primarily the current use program. We'll use that in a, as an example. The current use program is the major tax benefit program here in Vermont for, for farm owners um, who own agricultural or forest land. So we'll go through that. And we'll also get into uh, what kind of tools and resources can be used for assessing particular properties. So this is kind of while you are searching, but you know, after you've done um, all, of, all of this kind of homework, we're going to look at uh, what, you, what kind of online tools and, and resources are available at your town offices that can be used to assess particular parcels of land while you're searching. Um, so for example, we'll go through the web soil survey, and other information that's useful for assessing properties in the context of farm viability. So I just want to put in that plug um, and I'll hand it back to Kathy here. Thanks. All right, now let's talk a little bit about um, ownership. As Ben mentioned, there are um, certain critical elements that uh, prospective buyer of a farm or farmland need to line up. Um, certainly financing for most people is uh, an essential consideration and we're not going to go deeply into detail on this, but just to let you know that part of your exploration, um, you probably look at conventional lenders, community banks and so on. Um, there are also government loan programs, particularly through the Farm Service Agency that has a beginning farmer and rancher um, set of beginning farmer and rancher loan programs for real estate uh, as well as for uh, other capital needs and operating loans. And they also have a down payment loan program. In order to qualify for uh, an FSA loan, you need to demonstrate that you were turned down by another lender and they do have certain qualifications in terms of your management experience because of course they have to manage the risk involved in lending out public dollars. Um, they do have a set-aside amount for beginning farmers and they do encourage beginning farmers to come and speak with them. I've heard of a couple of examples of uh, young farmers that have made some very creative and positive arrangements with Farm Service Agency. 
you do need some patience. You know, there are government forms and so on and so forth, but um, it could be a, a really good opportunity. There is such a thing as owner financing in which the owner of the farm would self-mortgage uh, with you. That can be an attractive option. And there uh, is more interest on the part of unconventional partners such as conservation buyers, individuals or uh, groups that acquire land and then um, would typically, let's say, uh, remove the development rights and then turn around and rent under favorable terms to beginning farmers. Often uh, farmers who farm in a particular, um, you know, stewardship-minded way. Uh, sometimes those agreements are lease to own situations, which we'll talk a teeny bit about <coughs> in, a, in a future slide. Sometimes those can be uh, intentional communities. Uh, even CSA members have gathered together and uh, purchased property and then turned around and made it available to the, to the farmer. So um, as we'll talk about a little later under sort of creative alternative tenure, uh, it's really important to think outside the box. Okay, so we've got a question here. What's the average cost range? So hold on to that question because we're going to talk about determining rent in a few more slides. All right, um, can we go to the next slide? Oftentimes this question about what's a conservation or an agricultural easement, also known as a conservation or agricultural restriction, what does that mean to be on a property and how does it impact? Uh, there's a trend now in government to do this conservation. Okay, I'll follow up with that comment um, possibly offline. Um, probably most of you know what an easement or a conservation restriction is. It's essentially a uh, lien on the property which removes permanently, typically permanently, the right to develop that land. Traditional conservation easements, also known as purchase of development rights programs, are either funded by public dollars through the state, sometimes with federal matching dollars, or by private groups such as land trusts. Um, up until recently, the good news on development rights removal was that it did protect the land from development. However, it didn't typically, or necessarily I should say, make it, avail uh, make it affordable for farming. Even though the land should be valued at its agricultural value, it typically escalated to be sort of what the market would bear even for restricted farmland. It also didn't require that the land be farmed. So at its worst, a property could have its development rights removed, be bought by a, a wealthy landowner, and not have agriculture on it. More recently, uh, the Vermont Land Trust, the Department of Agriculture in Massachusetts, and some other public and private entities are trying to close that loop, those loopholes by requiring that the land be resold at its agricultural value and that it be sold to another farmer and that the, that the next landowner affirm that it will be inactive agriculture. So if you do see a parcel of land that has an easement on it, it's always essential to read all of the fine print in that easement to understand who owns the easement and what it would be like to farm on that land uh, with, with an easement. Uh, it's also possible to acquire land and at the point of acquisition or after you buy it to also possibly partner with a, a group that might want to place the easement and, and, um, and you would sell it. So there's a, a, a financial transaction there. We should mention the Vermont Farmland Access Program here. Um, okay, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ben. Thanks, Kathy. The Vermont Land Trust Farmland Access Program assists farmers who are trying to acquire land at that point of transition that Kathy just met mentioned, where there's a conservation easement that's, that's recently been placed on the farm or, or it's in the process of being placed uh, at, the form at, the, at the point of sale or transfer, and it gives the, the new farmer a chance to step in and acquire the property at a bargain price. Uh, so. The Vermont Land Trust has a farmland access program, and John Ramsey would be the contact for that program. There are eligibility requirements to be privy to those kinds of opportunities. 
uh, typically the, farm, the Vermont Land Trust Farmland Access Program um, opens up those kinds of opportunities to farmers who have been in, in, in business already, uh, who are, are somewhat well established and are, are on track to gross about $100,000 a year uh, within the next five years. So it's, it's kind of for uh, serious farmers who are still new to farming, but they've, but they've already been at it for a little while. So again, John, John Ramsey, Ramsey is the contact, the contact at the Vermont, Vermont, Vermont Land Trust for that program. program. I'm sure he I'm could sure give, he you give you many more many details. More details. Thanks. 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 Next slide, please. OK, what's in a lease? For those of you who have just joined, um, if you look in the chat box, Beth, you might send some last minute instructions for people to please use the chat box to enter questions and also put your email address so that you can receive um, materials after the uh, presentation is over. So um, getting down to some concrete discussion, what's in a lease? There are five basic elements that constitute a legal contract known as a lease. You have to name the parties to the lease. In other words, who's the landlord, who's the tenant. You need to describe the premises. Um, what is it that's going to be rented? What are the boundaries of it? What is the term? When does it start? When does it end? What is the fee if it's a, a cash rent? What is the arrangement? And then the signatures. So it can be as short as that. And that's essential to make it a contract. Next slide, please. So leases can typically also be more complicated. And depending on the length of the lease and the nature of the agreement, they can be uh, quite long and complicated. Typically, a lease might also consider who's responsible for maintenance and repairs. That's particularly relevant when there are structures uh, on the leasehold. What about improvements? Who's entitled to put improvements on the property? Who owns them? Who takes care of them? What happens to the improvements at the termination? What's the review process for placing them? Uh, sometimes it can be as picky as what kind of siting is permitted. Uh, that's siding, uh, building envelope, um, the placement of fencing, the kinds of materials that are used, and so on. It's always an important section to describe as particularly and as generally as possible both the permitted and prohibited uses. This is, sounds pretty obvious, but sometimes it's pretty tricky to say, you know, what's permitted? Is it all agricultural activity? Is it what people call generally accepted agricultural practices? One person's understanding of that might not be the same as another person's. Is something prohibited? Is it only prohibited without getting prior approval? And so on. And keep in mind that I'm going pretty fast through this. There is a lot more to say. Uh, there are examples of leases on the Land for Good website and elsewhere. And there are groups such as Land for Good and others um, who can help uh, draft and review leases. It's always good, especially with a more complicated lease, it's essential to have an attorney take a look at it just to make sure that all the I's are dotted. So uh, other provisions in, in a more elaborate lease uh, give you um, uh, explain the provisions for renewal, extension, and termination. In other words, how do you end a lease term and start another one? How do you extend an original lease term? And how do you terminate? That's really important because there always needs to be, especially for the tenant, an exit clause. Just because you're in a lease doesn't mean that you're an indentured servant to that landlord. There always needs to be a way for you to get out. You have to get re give reasonable notice. You might need to return the property to a, a good condition. In other words, you know, remove your crop residues, put a cover crop, um, you know, take away trash, and so on and so forth. Um, but you always should have an exit clause. Again, longer and more complicated leases require addressing liability and insurance issues. 
There always should be a discussion of what happens when either the landlord or the tenant default. In other words, you violate a term of your lease, um, how you can rectify that, what the process is, what the notification process is, and what happens when disputes come up. And even though the landlord and tenant might be uh, in a very loving and harmonious relationship, um, disagreements and misunderstandings will come up. And it's always important to figure out how to address those in a fair way so that uh, you're not anguishing when the time comes. Oftentimes, leases also have particular places where they address some of the stewardship uh, considerations. Sometimes it's in the body of a lease. More often, it makes more sense to refer to the stewardship uh, considerations. And for that, I mean what kinds of practices management practices, production practices are going to be allowed or required uh, in the agreement between the landlord and the tenant. An obvious example would be does the landlord want the farm to be farmed uh, under a certified organic regime? Does, it, does the landlord want it to be biodynamic? Does the landlord insist that there are livestock on the property or refuse to have livestock on the property? All those kinds of things can be addressed. Oftentimes, um, providing a conservation plan through NRCS or a simil similar land planning uh, entity satisfies the need for the landlord to understand sort of what kinds of management is going on uh, on his or her property. Next slide, please. OK, types. Oh, I'm going to pass it on. Ben, I'm, I'm just going to say that. Uh, and you can um, add to it later on. Um, ben is making an important point that a stewardship plan is a good idea regardless of whether it's in a lease or not. So that's absolutely true. And a landlord is always happy to learn about what you um, what you're planning to do and how the year went. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the, the landlord relationship slide. So let's see if there are any other questions popping up. OK, so we're, yes, the slides will be available. Uh, we'll also put them up on Land for Good. So let's talk about types of leases. This is pretty much of a laundry list of the kinds of leases that you might want to think about. First of all, people talk about oral versus written leases. In the US, the vast majority of leases are, in fact, oral, non-written, handshake leases. Uh, and although there is a strong culture around handshake leases, and they're very honorable and abiding among farming community members, most financial planners and legal advisors will say it's always better and sometimes absolutely necessary to have it in writing. Even those five essential elements that you can fit on half a page is better than having nothing at all. And more and more uh, lenders and uh, conservation program partners are requiring a written lease. So at minimum, have a written lease and not an oral lease if you can. Basic lease would be a short term lease, and that's typically annually, uh, a one-year lease, uh, could be a two- or three-year lease and still be considered a short-term lease. A variation on that, which is quite attractive and not enough people think about it, is what's called a rolling lease, which means that you may start out with a three-year term. At the end of the first year, it rolls and you have another three-year term. So it gives you a long enough, um, it only gives you three years security, but it's always leading out ahead of you. A long-term lease can be, let's see, Chris, I think I have to ask about this. this way. Uh, Land for Good does have lease templates available. They are on our website. We also can make more of them available. We also will help you customize a lease for your situation and we'll review any draft lease uh, and help you negotiate it. So a long-term lease, anything more than three years, could be five years, could be 10 years, could be 20 years. The maximum is 99 years. It's not typical, but there are examples which I'll tell you about shortly. 
anything over five years and certainly 10 or 20 years, you're going to need to have a lot more of the detail, detailed elements of the lease that I had uh, mentioned in an earlier slide. Um, a ground lease, this is where we will start to talk about um, that notion of building equity. A ground lease is where the farmer rents the land but owns the improvements or at least some of the improvements on the land. It's not very dissimilar from a commercial lease or from a condominium where you own the unit but you don't own the land on the unit. Equity Trust is a nonprofit based in Western Massachusetts that's done a lot of groundbreaking work in the area of ground leases which have been adopted from uh, or adapted I should say from the community land trust model in which a community land trust, in other words a community organization acquires land and then builds housing for people to own or allows people to build a home that they own. The advantage to that of course is that you uh, own the improvement, the home or the barn uh, and you can build equity in that and you turn around and sell it at the time that you terminate your lease. It's complicated but it's happening more and more. There are several examples. Uh, you might check um, the website of Indian Line Farm. That's Indian Line Farm or Caretaker Farm or Live Power Farm which is a farm in uh, California. Indian Line and Caretaker are both in uh, Massachusetts. They're complicated leases uh, but the advantage there is that you either sell the improvements to the next tenant. In some cases you have um, the opportunity to sell, it, to sell the improvements back to the land owner who might then uh, keep them, use them or turn around and resell them to a, a future tenant. Lease to own can be built into a lease, a short term or longer term lease. In other words, it means that there, there are two ways to do that, that you build into the lease a commitment for the tenant to purchase the land and a commitment for the landlord to sell the land at a time certain in the future. Or you can build into the lease the option for the tenant to be able to buy the land from the landowner uh, if and when the property goes on the market. So two options within that lease to own. It is possible to assign the lease payments toward the initial purchase and there are you know, a little bit of complicated situations of uh, conditions about how to determine the price, the future price and so on. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ben. He's going to talk a little bit about the nuances about the Thanks, IRS. Kathy. I just wanted to add a word of caution when you're developing a lease to own arrangement. Uh, the IRS can interpret this kind of arrangement as a sale. If you are, if within your lease to own agreement you're paying an inordinate amount of, of rental, of, of cash rental towards uh, your lease payment, uh, in other words you're paying let's say $2,000 a year for your lease payment and you're crediting that towards purchase, the IRS can interpret that as you have already bought the property. Um, and that would mean there, there are tremendously different tax implications. Uh, you know, that would mean you as the tenant could not deduct your lease payments you could, um, for your tax returns and it would mean that the landlord would be treated as, as an actual seller um, and they would have to start paying capital gains tax on those installments. So in other words, it would be treated as an installment sale for IRS purposes. So you really have to be careful. Um, it's suggested when you're developing a lease to own arrangement, get your accountant involved and get your, get your attorney to approve uh, the agreement so you don't fall into that trap. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Tim. Is the first right of refusal common? That is to say if the owner decides to sell, you get the first choice. That is the understanding of the right of first refusal and uh, it's, not an, it's not an uncommon or unusual transaction. It's not uncommon. We're entering the home stretch of the webinar. Okay, well we've got still a bunch of slides to go. So, um, all right, finally I'll just say really briefly, uh, leases can be used as a tool to transfer 
assets. I mean, lease to, to purchase of the property is one option, but you can have leases for uh, equipment, you can have leases for uh, structures, and you can even have leases for uh, livestock and build into that the, a provision to eventually transfer. Leases can be part of a succession plan uh, between uh, generations or unrelated parties as well. Next slide, please. Types of rent, very common question. Uh, also, how to determine rent, which we'll get into next. Uh, can the um, I'm going to hold off on questions. I'll take a couple more slides, and then we'll get back to them. The most common form of rental payment is a cash rent. Uh, there are several variations. Another one, uh, a variation on the plain cash rent where you're paying a determined amount either on a monthly or annual or quarterly basis or whatever it is. And by the way, a lease can make a provision for an adjustment in that cash amount over the course of the lease. And there are some either simple or complicated formulas for that. A share lease is an arrangement whereby the landlord takes more of the risk in, um, in the operation by uh, determining the amount of the rent in proportion to the success of the uh, enterprise. So in a good year, a landlord takes a, a, a percent, and in a bad year, a, the landlord takes a percent. And that can either be in the direct crop or the um, monetary equivalent. A flexible lease is sort of a hybrid of a cash and a share lease in which there is a, a floor amount determined that is uh, a, a solid cash amount that's typically less than a cash agreement. Uh, and in addition to that floor amount, there is a flexible share amount. So in a good year, the landlord makes out well. And in a bad year, the tenant only pays the floor amount. Uh, in kind is always an option. Ben uh, put up that caveat about uh, how the IRS uh, looks at um, cash versus in kind. Um, I'm getting distracted by the chat room here on my left. Uh, in kind, you can offer services. You can offer a CSA share. You can offer a cordwood. Uh, you can offer to keep the back area of recreation trails clear and wh whatever. So um, you can offer to do repairs. Uh, there are possibilities there. The, I believe that the webinar is on until 8.30, unless I am mistaken. Beth, you might want to uh, clarify that for us. Is there a way to summarize? This is Beth. Um, this is Beth. Um, I um, we can I keep on going until 8.30. And until just for people who may have thought it was going to go for just an hour, the webinar will be recorded. And it will be on our website um, at, at the New Farmer Project website. So if you aren't able to stay through to the end, you can pick up the last half hour um, through a recording. And also, if I don't get to everybody's questions, and I um, imagine the same would be true for Ben on this uh, webinar and the next one, um, we'd be happy to pick up on them. If you've given us your email address, we can talk by email. So next slide, please. Determining the rent, very popular question. There are a number of ways to do that, uh, and other resources that spell it out in a little bit more detail. Uh, very briefly, there is the market rate, which is simply to say find out what other people are charging or paying for similar situations. It used to be that the uh, USDA kept an average by county for irrigated and non-irrigated cropland and for pasture land. They no longer do that, but sometimes extension educators uh, or local um, USDA um, field offices do have some sense of what the going rate is for a property like what you're looking at or considering. Um, 
Sometimes landlords use a formula called the DIRTI-5, the Dirty 5, which stands for Depreciation, Interest, Repairs, Taxes, and Insurance. The landowner's carrying costs, once those are calculated, the landlord would uh, charge the equivalent. Now, sometimes there's a big disconnect between what it's going to cost the landlord to carry and what a beginning farmer especially can afford to pay. So that's where some negotiation happens in terms of whether the landowner is in fact willing to you know, subsidize or whether there's some in-kind exchange going on. Another way to calculate rent is in fact based on the resource capacity of the soils and some of the other uh, natural factors on that property. Can I repeat? DIR, depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance. Thanks for asking. Uh, similar to the resource capacity is actually the cost of production. I've um, navigated a couple of agreements where the landlord really wanted to see what the farmer could afford to pay to manage that farm the way the farmer, the way the landlord wanted it to be managed. And they struck an agreement based on you know, really transparency of that, of that business. So along with that, sometimes a a landowner will have social goals like wanting to uh, underwrite the startup of a young farm enterprise. Uh, I've heard of farm uh, owners who will not charge any rent because of the uh, current use tax benefit that they get by having their land in active agriculture. That's something that if the landowner isn't familiar, you as a prospective tenant should always point out. I believe every state, at least the ones we're talking about, um, have current use taxation where the property tax for a landowner is much lower if it's in active agriculture. And that active agriculture has to be described. And it's by um, income uh, or sales. It could be by uh, um, acre minimum and so on and so forth. But not to dismiss that many landlords will have uh, social uh, and uh, unique financial considerations that might go into calculating uh, a particular rent. Next slide, please. OK, so who are all these landlords? What's fascinating in this research that I did a couple of years ago is that nationally, nearly 90% of farm landlords are not farmers. So what we are led to understand by that is that there are a whole lot of people out there that own farmland that may or may not know that much about farming. They're increasingly removed from their farm properties both geographically and generationally. So they may need more information about what it means to have their land in agriculture, what it means to be a farm landlord. So there's a lot of negotiating that needs to be done as well. Uh, sometimes non-farming landlords are called absentee landlords. However, uh, it is as likely that they might live there, but they're not farming. So they could be resident or absentee. Several kinds of categories of landlords. Private land owners who include farmers. Oftentimes, farmers will rent to other farmers. Most of you, I'm sure, know that. And there are also a wide range of private non-farming land owners, people who have inherited farms, people who have purchased large properties, second homes, investments, and so on. Organizational landowners could include land trusts, religious organizations, educational institutions, um, school, uh, schools, colleges, and, and so on. Um, uh, we have been a part of a, a negotiation between a, a, a sisters of a particular order who own farmland in eastern Massachusetts who have very high stewardship and social goals um, for their organization. And they uh, made a very attractive uh, rental agreement with a farmer who will uh, then be able to purchase the land at a very affordable price down the road. And also, uh, the land will be restricted. So uh, oh, Ben is letting us know he's going to go into detail about um, uh, the formulas for um, determining rent as well from the landlord's point of view. Public land is also not something to be dismissed if we're talking about kinds of landlords and where to find land. 
Oftentimes, municipalities have acquired agriculturally capable open space and come to find out they don't know quite how to manage it or what to do with it and it's overgrown and a win-win situation would be for a farmer to come along and say, look, I can manage that, I can keep the view shed open, I'll keep the stone walls in good repair uh, and I will produce food for the community. All states also own land, either through departments of correction, through um, departments of education, hospitals, and so on. So um, that's also an another source. Massachusetts has a whole program devoted to renting land to farmers. <coughs> I'm not as familiar in other states, but I believe, believe most of them have similar kinds of opportunities. Next slide, please. Working with landlords, as I mentioned before, it is all about relationships. From the start and how you present yourself um, with clear goals uh, and a business plan, you might need uh, some references and a resume. It doesn't mean you have to present every element of your business plan. You have proprietary rights. Um, but the landlord is making uh, a really important relationship with you and a really important commitment. And so he or she has the right to uh, learn about you and uh, understand where you're coming from, how you um, imagine farming. Uh, your presentation is important. We worked with a young farm couple who was uh, looking for a farmland and they put together a little flyer about themselves and it had a photo of them and it talked very articulately about their farming goals. It had some examples of um, how they've succeeded in the market and it was a very effective communications tool. So don't underestimate or take lightly how it is that you come across to prospective landlords and uh, how you communicate with them. Always very important at the outside to clarify your goals and expectations as well as asking the landlord to be clear about theirs. All along the way after you've negotiated a lease and annually or monthly or whatever your agreement is to keep in communication. Let them know what's up, both the troubles that you've had, something's leaking, you've had a trespass or whatever, and also the successes. Had a wonderful year, you know, found a new, um, you know, endangered uh, lady slipper, whatever it is, to let them know that you're caring about their property. The negotiation is uh, ongoing. You're always going to need to figure out, okay, who's fixing this broken window and so on. And don't forget periodically to celebrate the fact that you actually have negotiated something that's working. Understand that there are cultural differences, especially if you wind up with a landlord that doesn't, uh, that isn't familiar with farming and doesn't have a farming background and doesn't understand why you don't have health insurance or that you have dreads or that you don't have a tractor and you like to use hand implements. Um, have them, you know, understand and learn about you and also understand that they may have some differences that uh, in terms of values or presentation that, uh, that are not familiar to you as well. And when in doubt and at the beginning always get assistance for how your um, lease is going to be um, negotiated for whether you have all of the details, what happens when you hit a stuck, stuck spot, do you have legal questions, do you have financial concerns, and so on. I have a flashing here that there's one of 43 hands raised, but I don't know what that means, Beth. Let's take the next slide. Okay, looking for farms. As I mentioned earlier, looking for farms, searching for a farm, finding a farm is obviously one step in a multi-step process. Make a plan. Figure out what it is that you're looking for, uh, whether you're going to look to purchase or rent, whether you're open to both possibly. Um, what in your scheme of things, I always like to think about what's necessary, what's desirable, and what's optional. I can't tell you how often a farm seeker has come 
to my attention and says, well, um, I'm looking for a farm and I'd really like to have 10 acres and it'd be great if it had a little farmhouse on it with a front porch and it'd be nice if it had a view and it'd be great if it had a, you know, a little pond and so on. Um, coming into a, uh, a search, not being able to distinguish what you absolutely need from your fantasy is a setup for your failure. So figure out what it is that you need, where you're flexible, and where something is a would be nice, but you know you can very well live without it in order to launch your farming career. And by the way, it's just as important to figure out what your personal and family needs are as your business needs. So where do you look? Certainly your personal network. If you have CSA members, I check with them, family, friends, and others, community people, neighbors, and so on. Linking programs can be one source. They are helpful. They are, in all candor, sometimes not as, um, as helpful as they might be. The properties might be dated. Uh, they're not always able to carry through in sort of all of the support work that's needed. But they're definitely valuable for um, looking at where properties might be listed. And sometimes you can get some additional support there as well. Land trusts and other conservation organizations have their fingers on the pulse of, of conserved properties, certainly. And some land trusts specialize uh, in agricultural properties. And so they're really a good resource. Um, real estate agents is the agent, uh, an agent for the buyer or for the seller. I've heard people have a lot of frustration with real estate agents. Um, mostly they're not specialists in agricultural properties, but if you do find one that is and does care about farming, certainly uh, that would be a good source. Ag commissions and conservation commissions also at the local level uh, know about what's out there and may have their, uh, their feelers out okay, for we you have as a well. bunch of good questions Next slide, coming please. in. Can I'm we gonna look take at a break? These chat questions. Kathy, okay. we have a bunch of good questions. Okay. Again, can we take a break? Yes, certainly. So let's oh. see. Uh, what is a linking program? I'm very sorry. A linking program is a program in which at least a list of available farm properties is maintained. And that list is derived from whoever has a farm property that decides to list with that program. In New England, we have New England Land Link. Uh, Connecticut Department of Agriculture has a Connecticut Farm Link program on its agency website. The Maine Farmland Trust has Maine Farm Link program. Vermont used to have a Farm Link program, and Ben is working hard to reinvigorate it. Uh, Raffle, a local uh, program in Vermont, I believe, has a small list. Uh, and that is it for linking. There's a linking program in New York State, and a couple of um, land trusts in the Hudson Valley have lists as well. So that's basically what a linking program is. Some of them also have other services. They try to uh, match, make a suitable match between seekers and owners. Sometimes they provide uh, assistance such as business planning, estate planning, lease design, and so on. So it's best to check the individual program and see what they can help you with. Uh, let's see. I have a lease with the state of Rhode Island. It's hard to communicate with them. Any tips on establishing better lines of communication? Katie, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. I've talked with somebody else in Rhode Island who expressed a similar uh, concern, so it, I'd be glad to talk about your situation in particular. I don't know whether you mean communicating with them, it's hard to reach them, or it's hard to um, get a dialogue going, what the hardships are. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to answer that question. Uh, ben is pointing out that um, the Vermont Agriculture Land Access Database will also uh, be launched really soon and enable farmers to search for opportunities online uh, in Vermont. When you lease land to farm, do, do you generally live there too? Well, that's a good question. It really depends. 
I can't say generally that would be true or not true. I would say, as I mentioned earlier, that farmer housing is really critical. Uh, if there is a house that goes with a rental property, it's always advised to have a residential lease separate from the rest of the farm lease, primarily because there are very clear tenant rights uh, considerations that go into the fine print of, uh, of a home lease that doesn't apply to farming. Uh, in any event, depending on your kind of farming situation, you might need to live on the property, you might need to live quite near the property, or you might be renting extra land that you can commute to. So it does depend. How do we find linking programs in the southeast? Um, I don't know of any except for um, North Carolina did have a linking program at one point. There is a national network of, of uh, beginning farmer slash linking programs called the National Farm Transition Network. And if you Google that, you'll be able to go onto their website and find the, um, all of the programs that, that uh, list there. That's called the National Farm Transition Network. Where can we find that info about Massachusetts State for farmland? I would contact the Department of Ag Resources uh, and ask for Barbara Hopson, H-O-P-S-O-N, who manages the land uh, rental program. Would Land for Good consult on leases outside of New England? Uh, depends on the nature of the consult. I'd certainly be happy to talk with you. Can you speak general supply versus demand of agriculture? Well, that's a great, very lofty question about the supply versus demand of agriculturally. There's a lot of demand. There are a lot of new people looking for land, and there are a lot of existing farmers looking for land uh, to rent or to purchase. So there is a lot of demand. I would say that we're only beginning to understand the general supply of land in the sense that there is uh, probably more agriculturally capable land out there than is being made available or that the landowners or managers even know or have thought about whether it should be or might be uh, in agriculture. So hard to say much more than that. There is a supply, there is a demand. Does that also apply if you own? Sorry, I don't know what we're talking about. Um, let's move on and see if we can roll our way through the rest of the slides. Living in a home on the land while farming for a living. Uh, that could apply if you're buying, um, you could buy a home next to land that you're renting. You could buy a home down the land from, uh, down the road from land that you have also bought. So I think that there's no hard and fast rule. Now getting back to the frequently asked question about how to look for farms. Uh, other sources of information are all of the many support organizations that there are. Anything from the local by local, uh, the by local programs, the organic associations, Farm Bureau, and so on. Uh, farm service organizations, professionals at the federal or state level, uh, including lenders such as Farm Credit, conservation districts that have very substantial mailing lists. Extension, of course, has um, um, local uh, offices in some states, not in all states. And your basic agricultural network, all of the input suppliers, the crop consultants, the veterinarians, and so on uh, that you might be in touch with. And certainly, uh, you know, it goes without saying, uh, farming events, workshops, conferences, um, twilight visits, and so on. I've seen people put up uh, signs, you know, in a, in a conference with land available or saying that they're looking for land. I've seen people click right in the hallway where you're doing the registration and, you know, sometimes serendipitously things work like that. Um, you can look in classifieds, for example, the Natural Farmer magazine uh, periodical put out by the Northeast Organic Farming Association has a section uh, where land is advertised and also people put in, you know, seeking farms 
My personal fantasy is that we have some kind of a coordinated system for the region that might have look something like a, a classified or a multiple listing service or a dating uh, website where we can um, be much more uh, comprehensive about listing land. Um, I just want to quickly speak to the ben, virtue of uh, talking with I'll your neighbors. I'll give my voice a rest um, and turn it over to you and you and can talk about the undiscovered land great question. undiscovered parcels of farmland that way. I know a lot of, of farmers who have great lease arrangements going. Um, they might own their, their core property or might be leasing their core property, but have just been out hunting one day and found the most beautiful farmland, um, and they're currently leasing it. Um, I have another example myself. I was out talking to my neighbor the other day, and um, he was plowing his driveway, and I I kind of was joking with him. I said, you know, I, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to buy your land, that land right there of yours. And you know, I was just joking, but he looked at me seriously, and I, you know, I couldn't believe it. I so I, you know, I looked at him back pretty seriously. I well, you know, said, "You are you serious?" So we have since been kind of negotiating under the table, and we're trying to to develop a owner financing arrangement. Uh, we might be partnering with FSA, so FSA might be financing a portion of the purchase, and um, my neighbors, as the landowners, might be financing another portion to enable me to purchase the entire parcel. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that um, you should not be afraid to talk with your neighbors. I know a lot of cases where um, farmers have discovered great opportunities just by getting out there and talking to people. Um, they've made announcement at t announcements at town meetings. Um, they've sent emails to, to local listers. I know there's the Front Porch Forum is emerging in towns across New England. That would be another great place to get the word out that you're looking for land. Great. Thanks, Ben. It's always good to hear personal success stories. Question came up about, is there as much rural land for lease available as close to town? I don't have any formal research on that, but anecdotally, I would say, sure. I say that there's uh, rural land uh, available for lease and for purchase. And as you might expect, it uh, might well be more affordable than uh, land in suburban uh, and metropolitan areas. I think small acreages are not necessarily harder to find than large acreage. Um, certainly many small farmers are, I mean beginning farmers are starting small. And I know of numbers of examples of where, you know, they start leasing with a couple of acres and uh, makes perfect sense and uh, it is possible to find. So let's see, we've just got a few more slides into the home stretch here. Beth, can you move us on to the next one? Talked about this before. When you're looking for farms and you've come upon one in terms of assessment, um, to think about what's necessary, desirable, and optional, and then uh, to work your way through uh, one or more checklist tools. And Ben will be talking about that in the next webinar session. Next slide, please. OK, so just a few more slides on what we mean by alternative tenure. What's alternative? Well, anything that's not a uh, straight out purchase with conventional financing, or anything that's not a straight out short term lease. Why do we need to think about alternatives? Well, for all the reasons we've talked about, that landlords are not conventional landlords anymore that um, the price of farmland and the limited availability even of um, landlords who are um, in a position to think about this makes us have to think a little bit outside the box. So non-traditional tenure uh, lease agreements, longer term leases, rolling leases, um, ground leases, uh, conservation easements to make things more affordable, affirmative action, um, affirmative ag clauses, and so on. So they still all f circle around whether you're purchasing or renting, but there are various variations. But before we move on to the next slide, it's also important to point out that you can farm without either leasing or renting. And oftentimes, it makes a lot of sense to start as an employee on somebody else's farm. And it's possible for you to uh, to um, be in a position uh, which would be called work in, where you're actually building uh, yourself into uh, an ownership position 
uh, starting possibly as an employee and then working into a, a partnership agreement or being part of a, uh, an LLC situation where the assets of the farm business and uh, real estate are gradually transferred to you. So um, those are not necessarily alternative situations, but they are alternative ways to thinking that you have to buy something outright or uh, lease something in an insecure situation. Okay, next slide, please. Also, somebody who's raising their hand, if you could just um, put into the chat box what your, your comment or your question. Ground leases I did cover a little bit earlier. Um, just to review, you rent the land long term. You can own and then sell the improvements. It's a way to build equity and also gives yourself maximum uh, security with a longer term lease. Oftentimes, ground leases um, have limited equity provisions, which means that you also cannot turn around and sell your improvement. Um, based on a speculative uh, gain in the market. In other words, if you bought a house uh, on a farm, you can't then turn around and you know build a put a jacuzzi on it and uh, sell it for uh, a zillion dollars. That uh, um, deed will be limited by what you can turn around and sell it for, um, because the purpose is to maintain perpetual affordability. So you'll be selling it to the next farmer taking into account appreciation and sweat equity and so on, um, but not speculative gain. Next slide. More alternatives. There's increasing interest, and Ben, you might talk to this um, on your, in your, you know, the next webinar, or if you have a comment uh, this time around, um, multiple tenants on larger properties. A larger property could be, for example, a dairy farm that's no longer viable as a dairy farm and that numbers of uh, independent enterprises might go in on something together or might join together to be a, a, a shared entity that acquires the property and somehow farms together. Sometimes it might be in an incubator situation or actually you know, several enterprises that are farming cooperatively. I've gotten several calls uh, just in the last month or so from people who are looking to invest in real estate, not as uh, land sharks, but as um, sort of uh, mission-driven investors who are interested in making a farming opportunity with patient capital. They might uh, acquire a piece of property and turn around and sell it. Um, at a more affordable price or rent it for a secure tenure situation. Um, there are also uh, foundations, philanthropic entities that are looking to invest that way, uh, not necessarily a grant, but to um, either uh, invest in property and then make it available. So keep your feelers out for those kinds of alternatives and uh, for groups that might be uh, trying to pursue that as well. And uh, there may be a variety of other kinds of partnerships. And Ben, if you want to weigh in on that, just um, shoot me a chat here and we'll open it up for you. In the meantime, let's go to the next slide. Different kinds of alternatives also include intentional communities and what are called agri-developments. Uh, there are several examples of um, co-housing communities and other kinds of intentional communities that have purposely been built around agriculture. They've designed the site so that farming is enabled and they've made housing available as one of the co-housing units, for example, on the, um, on the property. Don't be surprised to learn about um, more extensive residential subdivisions such as one called Agroburbia or Agrotopia or one called Serenby, which is in Georgia, which are quite large subdivisions, again, built around the notion of providing a farming opportunity, not to mention local food and a farm stand right within that subdivision. So uh, again, edge of the envelope, uh, but more and more because, as we all know, people are looking for more local food. They want to know where their food is coming from. They want to put a face on their food and so on. And no better than all of you all who are looking to establish farming opportunities than to try to develop those kinds of relationships. 
We have talked a little bit about non-traditional landlords, those uh, non-farming folks, the religious uh, entities, uh, other kinds of institutions. We've touched a little bit about on equity building models such as ground leases. And a uh, final thought is this uh, very interesting notion of transfer of farming rights where somebody owns a property and sells you the right over the long term to actually farm that property. It's different than a lease or a license. Uh, there's only one example that we've been able to find um, that's being tested in California. Um, but I think it has a lot of promise and I'm encouraging um, some folks I'm working with to explore that a little bit more. Next slide, please. Okay, very much the home stretch with four minutes left to go. So Land for Good, there's our website. We do have a tutorial, online interactive tutorial on um, leasing. We have a comprehensive online interactive course coming soon on land acquisition covering a lot of what we've talked about tonight and going particularly into more detail about farm search strategies and also financial readiness. We do have a, um, several sample leases and a bunch of links uh, related to this. We do individual consulting and we uh, hold a lot of workshops in the region. Next slide, please. Other resources include a book, a guidebook called Holding Ground, which is um, published by the New England Small Farm Institute. It's not available online. It's only available for purchase. It is a very comprehensive book uh, about ways to hold land that are not owning. So a lot of what we talked about here, lots of sample leases, uh, case studies, long-term leases, short-term leases, uh, speaks to landowners, gives example stewardship provisions, and so on. I mentioned earlier on Equity Trust. They have an online uh, document uh, guidebook called Preserving Farms for Farmers. California FarmLink is a FarmLink program that's very progressive in uh, its approach to uh, making land available and they have also only hard copy book called Farmer's Guide to Securing Farmland. Uh, online there is a curriculum about land tenure at that, at that uh, URL and then there's a guide to the business of farming in Vermont which is made available through uh, I believe the UVM website as well and uh, Beth will be able to provide that URL to you, uh, all of you who have given us uh, your website. So that is it. There's my email. I welcome uh, custom email questions from you and anything that I haven't answered. So thank you. I appreciate your feedback. And um, I'll turn Thanks, it back Kathy. over to you, um, Beth. I can see we have a last question or two coming Thanks, up. Kathy. Um, a very general idea of cost to lease per acre or up. otherwise. A uh, very general um, idea of cost to lease per acre or otherwise. Yeah, really common question and it's really hard to say. An uh, acre of good vegetable bottom land could be $100 an acre, it could be $400 an acre, it could be $75 an acre per year. Uh, more marginal pasture land could be $35 an acre. You know, it really, really depends. So don't quote me, but you know, so it's sort I'm going to just ballpark. wrap things up here. This is Beth again. So thank you all so for participating. Um, I'd like to remind you all, if you haven't already, to enter your email. I'll leave this open for a few more minutes so you have time to do that. Also to remind you that our next webinar is on March 23rd at 7 p.m. and we'll be going into more details on many of these topics. And I'm just curious where many of you are from. So if you have a minute and you can just type in the state that you're from, I think that would be really interesting for us to know. So thank you very much and we're going to sign off. For us to know. So thank you very much and we're going to sign off. Bye bye now. Bye bye now.